Hey guys, Shay here from Fool on a Journey. Today I'm going to be talking about how I organize a collection of over 200 decks. I'm going to be talking about how I sort of keep them presented where I can see them, but they're away enough that I'm not overwhelmed with options. Um, and my weekly practice and how I incorporate multiple decks so that I feel like I'm using all of those things to my greatest advantage. So organization. The picture that you're looking at here on the left is my Tower of Tarot, which is a terrible, terrible, terrible name for the tower in which you store your tarot cards because the tower in tarot is literal destruction. So I really need a new one, but it just it sounds good. You know what I mean? It's too late. Um, and each one of these cubbies is a season. So starting from the very bottom, you've got a winter box. Going up, you've got a fall box, and so on and so forth. The top two are for the decks that did not fit clearly in either fall or winter, but were clearly a dark half of the year. So the two at the top, the one at the very top, is the light half of the year, and then the dark half of the year. To label these boxes, um, I actually took a picture of, scanned, and then printed strips of the seasonal cards from the Living Wheel Astrology, and they turned out amazing. So there are two cards for each season, quarter and cross-quarter days of the year, two for spring and summer, and then all four of those together make the light half box. Um, because my handwriting's gross and I didn't want to look at it and I needed a good way to recognize what I was looking at. So why? What is the point of doing all of this seasonal nonsense? So when you're trying to pick a deck to use, I would get that anxiety overwhelm of I have 200 decks to choose from. What? I could use anything. And then I would spend all the time that I meant to do a reading trying to pick a deck. And then by the time I actually get it out and pull a card, it's like, okay, time's up. I have to move on to, you know, the next part of my day. So I just needed a better idea. And you can see here that I wanted to thank Don Michelle from Boho Tarot. She not only gave me the idea to do it seasonally, um, she also sort of gave me a bunch of vague ideas that I picked apart and turned into this whole process. So it started with the seasonal thing. Then when she sort of was showing off her collection, she was showing that she had classified everything. So she had types of decks and that was really helpful to me to start as a, a way to think about my decks differently um, and then also this the spread system that I use is another thing that she also sort of helped inspire vaguely um, so if you are looking for someone to help you turn on your light bulb for some good ideas definitely check out her channel it is linked below so that is how I keep all of my decks they are somewhere in that tower classification of decks. I ended up with 13. It's more than I need and honestly it's very easy to see some overlap within those even as I'm talking about them. I'm sure that you will notice it and it will be very clear that decks would fit in multiple classifications but this is what works. It's the system that that made sense to me. Whatever makes sense to you would work for you honestly. So just if anybody's like it's very obvious that the classifications are super similar. Yes, totally. But 13 is my lucky number. So here we go. Uh, starting on the top shelf. So from the top left, you have moon and then goddess and then astrology, animal, rune, botanical. Those are like my smallest groups. I have very few of those decks. They're very, very specific. Um, you know, for example, I only have two goddess decks. So one's for the light half of the year, one's for the dark half of the year, and I always have goddesses where I can reach them. Um, astrology, I've got four, so it's one for every season. Those are very limited and they're super specific. Now, having said that, yes, some of those decks would fit in some of the other categories, but it just makes sense to always have something like that because those energies just feel different. Like when you see them laid out in the cards, they just, I don't know, they have a different voice to me, so they got their own classification. Bottom row are the much bigger classifications where I have a lot more decks, and that is where the lines get a little bit cloudy, um, but let's just get them out there and then we can talk about it. So starting from the bottom left, you have Esoteric, Rider Waite Smith clone, Cardamancy, Pip deck, Intuitive deck, Keyword deck, and then Unique. 
So it's like a total own system. Um, esoteric, definitely, that was one of the first ones that I knew needed its own classification because I definitely have some decks that are just so wildly esoteric and just don't feel right to use for things that are not mystically or spiritually inclined. Like that's just kind of where they belong. That's just what I feel when I see them. That art moves me in a different way. The symbolism is different. Um, so I knew that classification immediately. The rest of this row kind of just happened. Um, I knew that I wanted decks that I think of as like easy readers and for me that's anything that's a Rider Waite Smith clone. I'm sure people, you know, the one that you're looking at right there as an example is the Wonderlight Tarot, which some people probably wouldn't even see uh, as a Rider Waite clone because it's definitely different. Um, but anything that I can immediately pull out of the box and it all makes sense. You know, like if I pull the six of wands, I know it just by looking at this picture. I know exactly what it is. I know exactly what it means. And I know how to utilize that card in a reading. So those decks, easy readers. And I would imagine that that category is going to get bigger as some of the other ones get smaller. Like the more certain decks kind of become a comfort and I see where the normal symbolism is in that deck, the more I'll feel comfortable sort of putting it in that spot. But right now, that one is actually a pretty small category. Um, Cardamancy covers anything that's like Lenormand, my playing card decks. The symbol is the oracle kind of decks, you know, like you're looking at, when you look at a bird, the word says bird and you're looking at a bird but you know that birds it's about communication and flights of fancy kind of thing um that anything that falls into those kind of categories that's cardamancy pip decks cover the marseille cover i initially i was calling it marseille but i realized that i had some that sort of were really doing their own thing but just had like pip minors and they needed to go somewhere, so that's where they went. When I say intuitive, what I really mean is vaguely it's familiar. It's not that they're hard to read, it's that you really have to be willing to reach into the artwork and let the artwork talk to you. Um, you know, I'll use that same example again. So on a Rider Waite Smith clone, you pull the Six of Wands, right? You clearly have this victor who has clearly won something. Um, there's a crowd of people looking up at someone, right? That's the, the typical Six of Wands. Well, on an intuitive deck, it may be somebody winning something in a different way. It may be from a different perspective. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to project that victory. You know, someone could win a race you know, and there's people cheering at the finish line of a race. That would be the same as the Six of Wands. But again, it comes into looking at the artwork and, and letting the artwork talk to you. And the ones that need a little more time to sort of sit and sink in, those fall into my category of intuitive. And then the next one was keyword. I mean, let's be honest, like if it's a beautiful picture and then a keyword, it's a keyword deck. I love them. It's actually what I've been buying the most of recently um, because I realized that I wanted them and I didn't have many. I kept buying tarot decks and I was like, you know what, we kind of might need to filter some of this out with some different stuff, um, which is where the, the last two categories of keyword and then unique fall into. So what do I mean by unique? Those are the weird ones. Those are the ones that are really doing their own thing and you have to actually learn a new system in order to be able to use them. So the best example that I can think of is I have the Camelot Oracle, which is split into places and people. And in order to read the deck the way that it was intended, you would pull a couple of place cards and then you put a couple of people cards on top of those places and then they mean different things. That would be a totally unique system right? That doesn't fall into any of the other categories. The way that I have it sitting out um, on the shelf is you sort of know the specifics are on top. The more broad, standard kind of stuff is on the bottom. You can see very small in this picture, um, it sitting right between the Cardamancy and the Rider Waite Smith clone are two little green dice. They are very, very special to me. They're a very big part of my system that I have worked out here. They came to me all the way from Paris 20 years ago from a best friend who knew that I definitely needed dice from Paris when she got back, so it was very exciting. Um, and they control the random. So, so far, everything that you're talking about is very much my control, right? I chose where all the decks go. I chose the seasons that they go into. You know, I, I 
I settle the classifications. It's very much things that I was doing. And once I got that set, I realized that I had lost a randomness to my system. There was nothing really random. There was no, the universe was speaking to me in this way. Um, and I needed to add that some, somehow, some way. I just, I had to get something random to shake up the system a little bit. So every week, a deck gets chosen at total random by this dice. Now, obviously, you got to have more than just 12 numbers on a dice to choose a deck. We'll get there. So I roll the dice. Now, there are 13 classifications. If you know anything about a standard six dice, if you roll two of them, you cannot get a one. So that means that number one, okay, which of 13, right, number one will never get chosen and 13 will never get chosen. So you can't, you can't roll 13 and you can't roll a 1, which is perfect because my goddess and my moon decks, I only have two. They'll both get, you know, all four of those will get used every year. We don't need to mix those up. So essentially I'm rolling for the other ones. And then whatever I hit, whatever classification number it lands on, you know, so, it, you know, if it lands on a, a 7 and it's cardamancy, okay. So you roll the dice, you get a classification. All of my decks that fall under that classification, completely regardless of season, are all on Wheel of Fortune wheels within an app. Uh, the app that I use is called Tiny Decisions, but I'm sure there are better ones. There are a bunch of apps that do, you know, you can input um, options and then spin a wheel and it'll give you a random one. Uh, I will warn you that if you use Tiny Decisions, the commercials are really annoying. Like, you're going to get one literally every time you spin. I don't use it very often, so it's still working for me, but, you know, disclaimer warning. Um, so I roll the dice, I get a classification, and then I spin that classification's wheel, and any random deck could pop up that is that classification. And then just for the week, I will replace that deck on the shelf. Now, why does it matter that it's just for the week? Because most of those decks are going to be out for about a month and a half, right? So if it's one of the top shelf, it's there for a full season. So from, you know, the beginning of spring to the end of spring. Uh, the bottom shelf, I would do this, I would change at the season and the cross quarters. So they're up there for a long time. So when I pick a deck to sit up there, it's going to be sitting up there for a while, unless I put it away just for the week when it's been replaced by the deck the dice has chosen which also gives a really cool random element to just throw in the mix of all of these decks that look like spring and then suddenly you have this super creepy Halloween deck could have popped up in, from the dice. So it's been really cool and it's been working really well and if you don't have anything random about how you're choosing your decks, I definitely challenge you to try it and tell me how amazing it is because it will be amazing. So all of that was focused on the decks and how I choose them and how they sit out and where they go. Now let's read with them. So my process. Again, this was an idea that was sparked by Don Michelle at Boho Taro, link to channel down below. She does this progressive reading where she builds on a three card to a nine card over the week. Um, I think the way that she said her process, it was like three cards on Monday, three more cards on Wednesday, and then three more cards on Friday. And I like liked the idea of building, like something about that, the progressive spread where you start here and then you expand and expand and expand, really got gears and wheels just turning in my brain. And then we ended up here. And how did we end up here? I don't know, somehow, but it works. When we start a cycle, right now cycles are starting on Sunday, they could start any day. Um, but they would go for seven days. So you start by pulling a goddess. So I pull a goddess, I'll see what the goddess is gonna be for that week. This is all about an energy I want to embody. I want to embrace this aspect of my person, find the Cordelia within me kind of thing. Um, and then I will choose another deck from the top row for some added energies. Um, specifically in this picture, you can see I pulled a couple more cards from the uh, Heavenly Bodies Astrology deck. That is the energy that I am trying to project all week. So you sort of create this idea of what does it mean to be Cordelia, Fire, and North Node. You do just a little bit of journaling about it. Like, I mean, I definitely journal a lot about all of this process, but you have to have a clear concept in mind. Like, you can't just sit and be like, okay, that's what I'm going to embody. Like, you got to know what does that mean? Okay, what am I going to do to embody this? You know, what's some planning about this that I'm going to actively do to present this part of me? 
and then I will pull six cards that are daily cards. So this is the daily reading for the week that is coming using the deck that was chosen by the dice. So this week um, that you're looking at here, the dice chose the Fantastical Tarot, which is definitely wild and wacky to see with all of my spring decks. I love it. And you sort of just look at the picture and I do take that as a collective reading. Uh, so I would let sort of whatever shows up in that line start talking to me. Um, I know the first thing that I saw were the light skies. So the only daytime skies were in the Seven of Cups and the Chariot. And then just keep going from there and making notes and seeing what it looks like. And then once I've kind of got a solid reading on those six cards, I turn each one of those cards into a question. So every single one of those cards, after I've read the whole line as a reading, becomes a prompt for a question that I'm going to consider each day. So it's just another journal prompt that's coming up for the week. But I have all those questions set on that very first day of, you know, of the week. So as soon as I've pulled them all and I've, you know, written down what I think this means, then it's Monday question is, Tuesday question is. So I have all of them already set. Back on that tarot altar that you were looking at before under my shelves, I will set out the energy cards. So the the goddess and the astrology cards in this picture and then I will stack the cards from the dailies on top of each other starting from Saturday and going up so that Monday's on top and then right before I go to bed Sunday night uh, as I leave my library I will sit that card um, right next to the energies so that I'm ready to go for the next day and getting into what am I going to do every day with these cards. So here's an example of a daily spread. So again, you can see my goddess and the astrology cards, which were my energy cards, are already there. I would have put the card that is from the Fantastical Tarot, you can tell because it's the really dark one, um, that King of Wands, would have already been sitting out. I would have had it waiting there for me the night before so that when I see my altar in the morning, all I would see is the energy and the question. And then in thinking about that question, I would think about the types of decks that would answer that question the best from within those classifications. Uh, and in this instance, I chose the botanical deck and a cardamancy card um, and sort of let them answer that question. Now you can see that I moved the goddess around and I do sort of, I let whatever aesthetical artistic feeling that's moving through me help me sort of shape them. Um, and I set them out first thing in the morning. So I, I get up, I make my coffee, and as soon as I walk into my library, I see that my tarot altar is waiting for me, and I put cards on it. And then I sit down and drink my coffee. Um, and where I sit, it is right to my left. I can see the table, I can see the cards, I can see the question, uh, and I just sort of let it sink in. Um, and I actually don't write anything down or do anything to interpret it initially beyond just what does it look like, and then go about my day um, and then usually in the afternoon or you know right after lunch um, I'll journal about what I think the answer to that question is and just in general journaling about that question and the answer the way that the cards answered that question for me and then that's usually when I snap my picture and throw it on Instagram along with the question so if you're ever looking for journal prompts my Instagram is full of the questions that I'm asking myself daily but I did stop sharing interpretations on Instagram it was just getting a little bit too personal, um, which is great, and I was loving that, but then it felt too weird to, to post that. So, um, But the questions are always there, so if you're looking for some questions, there you go. Follow me on Instagram. And then after six days of dailies, that way you hit the Sunday review. So you end up re-evaluating everything um, at the end. So each day you're building this small little spread, but then at the end of the week you realize that you've actually built this huge spread. So how I pulled them, you're looking at energy cards, and I am sorry this is a different week, but the week pictures I was showing you before are from a week that I haven't reviewed yet. Um, so this is an old one. But you can see I was using for the energy a goddess card and an animal card from the spirit song. And then the weekly pull from the dice chosen deck was the Marshmallow Marseille. So you can see that week going across and then the cards I pulled each day underneath those cards. And I don't interpret this too intensely. Like I like to look at it because sometimes just how you look at something, the way that it came out, 
will give you some kind of ping. Um, the one that actually hit for this one, I vividly remember, was that rune card from the Rune Dragons straight in the middle. And I can't remember what the name of that rune is, but I do vividly remember that its meaning was obstacles and memorials. And it really felt like you were moving, you were moving, you were moving, and then bam, roadblock. And then the rest of the week. And that was really interesting to sort of visualize. Um, and I definitely journal a little bit about that just because that stuck out so much, but I don't really get too in-depth with how I pulled them. What I do really focus on is how I move them. So what does that mean? The more that you look at them collectively, right? So then I'll like pile them up. Here's all the cards that I pulled from the Marshmallow Marseille. Here's, you know, the decks where I only ever pulled one card. Here's, you know, decks where I pulled a bunch, you know, that kind of thing. And you just start realizing what all these different cards mean and you make the narrative based on what the cards are so instead of letting the cards talk to you you control them and you write a story with the cards that you were presented i specifically do it for a lesson that i have learned or want to have learned or some part of me that i want to evaluate or that i um feel like I have successfully evaluated, uh, I do try to keep that review as a little bit of a boost. Like, hey, you're doing this great. You know, you should do this better, but this has been going good. Um, you don't want it to all be negative all the time, and you don't always want it to be, this is what you need to fix. Sometimes it just needs to be a pat on the back. And I think this is just a great way to do it. Not a lot of people will talk extensively about cognitively chosen cards instead of randomly chosen cards and spreads, and I think it's really, really powerful. I know that Kellyanne Maddox did a video about it years ago. It's somewhere in you know, her huge library of videos where she was talking about how it can be really powerful magic to look at the spread positions and then decide, I'm going to make this be the answer to that question. Um, and then the other person who spoke about it was in the Tarot Activity book uh, by Andy Matzner. I've reviewed that book on this channel. Um, he talked about how it can be really strong to just don't worry about knowing, you know, even if you don't know how to read the tarot cards, you know, read a spread and then look through the deck, look at the cards and pick what you want to be those things. I am really enjoying that. And if you've never done it before, please try it. I think that you will like it. Um, yeah, so then, you know, here's this creation, and we started in the confusion of the Seven of Cups from the Wonderlight Tarot on the left. There were two Empress cards pulled that week, so I stacked them, and then I just decided to put the other cards that were from those decks with them. Um, and then I just liked the idea of sort of like ending the week on magic coming off of that Six of Swords. It just seemed to make sense. Um, I rearranged even the weekly cards from the uh, Marshmallow Marseille in a way that spoke to me. There was just a lot that I chose. You will find the decks you would have never read together, that you would have never paired up, look so good together. I would never have in a million years thought to pair the Wonderlight Tarot with the R Tarot, but that looks amazing. You know, I never would have thought that, um, you know, what the Heavenly Bodies astrology deck really needs is a Rune Dragon card with it that would really make it pop. Like, you just wouldn't think of that until you start building them up individually. The more that I pull random cards Monday through Saturday, the more random art I get to mix up on Sunday and I really enjoy that process and it can be a really great way to get to know how your decks sort of communicate with each other. So that is everything. That is how all of my decks are stored. That is how I use them. That is my weekly slash daily practice. I hope that you will try out things like letting some kind of randomization choose a deck for you, like laying out a bunch of cards and then moving them around and making the spread for yourself, and let me know how it goes. If you have any questions, of course, you can leave them in the comment section, and if you got this far, thank you so much, and if you are feeling um, extra gracious, you could like and subscribe, uh, and as always, thanks for watching.